Hello and welcome to the Liverpool Connection podcast. I am on my own today. My name is Daz. If uh, you're just tuning in for the first time, um, this is basically a podcast where we bring on people to tell their stories. Um, usually it's uh, Liverpool Football Club related, but um, we are doing kind of a, a new a new um, section kind of uh, of the podcast where it's called the uh, Liverpool on the ground and it's basically bringing musicians, artists, uh, like-minded people on to tell their stories and uh, this is, I'm really, really happy to bring uh, our next guest in. Um, Not only is he a very talented artist, but he has one hell of a story to tell. But I congratulate you uh, also on the the new ambassador for the Owen McVeigh Foundation, because I, I know Mark, uh, he's yeah. been on the show before and he's absolutely boss and, and they couldn't have picked, you know, a better person to do it. Um, you, you're going to, you know, push push the Owen McVeigh Foundation out there, uh, which which is really great. Uh, it needs to, you know, get as much money to help these kids because I think it's a fantastic foundation. But um I'm, I'm babbling too much, but anyway, our uh, special guest for today is John Charles. Hi, mate. All right, Dad. Nice one. Nice to meet well, you, mate. And uh, just as we were talking, you know my first question. He's not yeah. a Liverpool supporter. He supports Blackburn Rovers of all <laughs> fucking teams. <laughs> Even though I do have a pair of uh, chainers that got, it's got Blackburn on them, but they're, they're specials, so uh, I guess I'm all right with that. Do you know what? I've actually got a custom pair as well of Adidas trainees with Blackburn all over them. Do you? They got a oh, custom pair, of these, yeah. You, you you should have uh, you should have brought those on. Yeah, right. I'm I'm obviously you can tell I'm a collector. That's only a third. The the other shit's in the in the in the closet. My missus won't won't let me break it out. Yeah, I only wear like three pairs of those shoes. I just look at them all day, just going, God, they're nice. I'm I'm more of a silhouette person, so I like the you know the silhouette of the shoe. Yeah, I know it's a weird thing, but you know, us uh, us Cheney guys, you know, are a bit weird. But anyways, I like Jordans. Huh? I like Jordans. That's my Cheney thing. Well, I, I should have should have noticed with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, go on, Blackburn, Blackburn Rovers. So, Come on, give it to me. As I, when I was a kid. I was a typical kid. I had all the football kits. And I remember having, I had a Newcastle football kit. I had an Aston Villa football kit. I had Liverpool football kits as well. I just loved football as a kid. When I was nine, <clears throat> I went to bed. It was all my family holiday. And um, we met two, loads of different families out there. And there was, he was one family. Um, and there was a girl called Kate and a, a, a girl called Claire. And they were Black Bear fans. And they were a few years older than me, but as a nine-year-old, I was just like, oh, these are gorgeous, these kids. I was just fascinated with them. Like, probably one of my first little crushes that I ever had. And literally from that, I just pretended that I supported Blackburn. I was like, yeah, yeah, I support Blackburn. Because in my head, it's like, ah, this could be my girlfriend, yes, if you're a Blackburn fan. And from the age of nine, that I, never, I just never, ever went back. And I mean, I probably spoke to them for about two months after that holiday. As little pen pals sending letters back and forth. Um, but I never, ever changed my football team. I stayed with Blackburn ever since. And obviously, I think about three years after that, we won the league then anyway. And luckily for me, where I live, or where I lived in Kirby, Anfields was down the, the East Lanks. So the game that we won the league, Blackburn were playing at Anfields. And I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been John Barnes or, or was it Jamie Redknapp who scored a free kick right at the end because you won, didn't you? Mm-hmm. But then Man United got beat, which meant we won the league. But what was boss for me was that all the Blackburn fans literally had to drive past the end of my road on the way back to Blackburn. So I'm out there with my football, my top on, bouncing around. All the fans were jumping out the cars, grabbing me. To, it, was like, it was boss. I absolutely loved it. And that cemented my love for the for Blackburn even more after that. So what were but your then, doing when you were doing that? Uh, I don't want to remember one kid come running after me trying to whip me up because he was a Liverpool <laughs> fan. 
But um, it was boss. It was that was obviously when I really, I even loved him even more after that. But then years later, when I got older and I was able to drive, well, in fact, I was getting the train for a bit. I got a season ticket. I had a season ticket for about five years. Um, I went to watch us play over in Bulgaria. I went as when we went to Scotland and we uh, played Celtic. So I travelled a little bit with them as well. And yeah, I loved it. The only the reason I got rid of my season ticket in the end was because I met my now wife and um, I become besotted with her like I did the other two black bear girls. <laughs> you didn't have to go chasing them anymore, did you? Nah, uh, that's it. <laughs> and then and I remember there was one game we were playing Crystal Palace at home. I think it was Andrew, Andy Johnson. Did he use Andrew Johnson? Something like that. I can't remember Skinhead fella used to play for Palace. I just remember him playing. And at half time, I was like, I want to get home and see me birds. I want to go home and see my girlfriend. And I left at half time. And that was the last time I went to a match. I haven't been to Ewood Park now for, I don't know, it must be a good five or six years. Do you, st- do you still watch, watch the highlights? Yeah, still, still, you know. Whenever we're on the telly, I watch on the telly. And, oh. We were doing great until a couple of games back, and now we're just it's gone downhill again. Uh, at least, at least your you, your missus now isn't an Evertonian. No, no, she's a red. Ah, oh, see, the, the smart, the smart side of the family. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your your family's reds, right? As you you were saying. Yeah, all my family are reds. Uh, my dad used to take me to the game when I was younger. Obviously. Even when I was a Blackburn fan, he used to try and take me to the game. And I remember him taking me to when the Liverpool played Coventry, and it was one of the worst games I've ever seen in my life. Um, but yeah, me mum, eh, me, me dad and my sister have had season tickets for as long as I can remember. All of them, they're all reds. Is it, no is, it is it tough, like, you know, when they come over and they're, they're talking about the reds and, you know, winning trophies, and there you are? Do you know what the best thing about being a Blackburn fan is? Is I can just stay out of every argument because we're, we're crap. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just dead easy. Like, I don't have to be involved in that red and blue row. I don't have to be involved in any of that. Um, I can just sit back and be like, listen, I know who we are. I, I'm happy with it. I can deal with that. Well, you have won the league as well, you know. Well, I can't claim that anymore, you know. That, I used that for years and years. At least you won the Premier League. It doesn't work now, does it? Well, I'll tell you what, if, if Liverpool only win one Premier League, I'll be talking about that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I can see Liverpool you know, winning the Prem. O- hopefully this, this year I've not given up yet. Not yet. Nah, I but, wouldn't give up just yet. I, I, it's I, a funny I, league, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, especially when all the matches are coming you know, thick and fast with Champions League and the FA Cup and that stuff. I, I think if we can get it down to six, breathing down City's neck, and then we play City, um, and we beat City, I think it's on. So Have you yeah. still got a game in hand now? Yeah, yeah, um, against Leeds. So uh, it's Norwich this weekend, and then Leeds midweek, and then the Cup final against Chelsea. It's nice to be back at Wembley. Yeah. <laughs> It's just yeah. the same I'm over here, you know, all my, all my mates are going, and, you know. It's just, I, I, that's one one thing I really miss about being back home, just being with mates and, and going to the football matches, you know, because it, it, it's a whole day event, isn't it? It's not like you just you just go. You, you go to the pub before and, you know, you, you get some scran in you and you go watch the match and then afterwards, you know, if you're feeling all right, you'll, you, and, you, have, you know, it's a win, then you... you, you you know, pints are flowing. So, yeah, I, I, I missed that big time. Yeah. I've Especially, only had one final with Black Bear that was waiting to come when we played Tottenham. And I'm, good God. That, I'm was, go, was that 2011 or something like that? Or even further back? I think so. I think we had Andy Cole and Dwight York at the time. I'm sure we did. We won, though. And I got, at least I got to see that as well. But that was in the Millennium, the Millennium Stadium. Yeah, in Cardiff. Yeah, no Wembley, is it? No, I'm, I'm, I had a mate that actually thinks Cardiff is better than Wembley. I'm like, you, you must be joking. <laughs> and I'm like, you must like sheep. <laughs> so, 
So um, now we got the Blackburn Rovers thing off 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 your chest, and it, you know you can get loose now. Um, uh, you know, I always like to know where where the artistic, you know comes from like you know when did you start like going i'm all right at this yeah well obviously we're only on for about 45 minutes i could talk about this for hours and hours and hours so i'll try and shorten it down but like as a kid like five or six i always used to draw that was like my passion i'd have giant pads of paper like a one size paper and I would fill every side with drawings. Quite often it would be Disney. Um, when I went to in primary school, it was my last year of primary school, and I had a teacher called Mrs. Lomax, who's now called uh, Miss Willis. And she was w- when I really, really found the love for art. She like made art really fun. And then I went to senior school, and I carried on my art then. And I was, I could see that I was getting really, like all the teachers were all, everyone was always like, oh, he's amazing, he's amazing. And um, I knew then I was decent at art. I think I only got an A in my GCSEs. And I remember my art teacher being disappointed in me, saying like, that should have been an A star. I was like, oh, Christ. And then, um, but then I left school and I never touched art again. And I never, from the eight, I left school at 15, the day after I was working behind bars in Wembley Stadium, mm-hmm. funny enough, um, I was working like an agency. So I never ever drew or painted from the age of 15 until I was about 27. Wow. Um, I mean, that that's a big break, you know, from, from not, not doing anything. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm sure, like, you know, in, in your head as well, like being, being that young, you're going, I'm not going to make any money, you know, doing drawings for people. So, I mean, for, for going from, from there as well, like, uh, it can be, uh, I mean, mo- most people that are artistic, they'll, they'll go to art school, you know, uh, to help them, like, refine what they do. Yeah. But your, yours is just self-taught, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I have not got, I haven't got anything against people that go to art school or anything, but I'm not one for playing by the rules. Mm-hmm. I, I, I feel like I've broke away from that typical arty farty world where you can only do this, you can't do this. Like I've said, if only if you've seen my documentary yet, but I say it and that, like I'll do whatever I want, kind of thing. I'll paint what I want, I'll paint how I want. Who's right? Who, who can say that's wrong? Like that's where I, I think about it. Like nobody in this world can say. The way you've painted that or the way you've drawn that is wrong because it's just how I see it. Do you know what I mean? Like, so art school wouldn't have been any good for me. Even when I was doing GCSE art, very rarely would the teacher say, you have to do it this way. They'd recommend try this style or try this style, give it a go, and then whatever you like from that, you might then incorporate into your own work. And that's what I tend to do. So there's a lot of artists who I do like. But you'll never see their style of work in mine. But then there's other artists who are like, and you might see little glimpses of their work within mine as well. So I get influenced by other people a little bit. But yeah, no art school. Everything that I've done has been self-taught. Who who are actually some of your you know favourite artists? Uh, hands down, it would be Van Gogh would be my favourite artist. So if you look at the way he paints, he paints very thick. He puts the paint on really thick with a brush, but I use a palette knife. So I, I, I paint with a brush at the beginning, but then when I finish my paint, it's all palette knife work. So if anybody who's listening who doesn't know what a palette knife is, it looks like a mini trowel that like a builder would use. So that's what I apply the paint on. So my, like that's that's the inspiration that I've taken from likes of Van Gogh. Then you've got um, Rembrandt, who is like a really fine artist, but I don't, I don't paint like that. But I love his use of light, so I get inspiration from him. Jackson Pollock, uh, he's just crazy, and I, you know, I, I get inspiration from him. But I'm inspired by the people and the personalities and the life, as well as the paint and the way that the the execute paintings as well. Yeah, I've seen it in your work. Like you use a lot of colours, which I love. You know, um, one of my favourites is the. 
there. I, I think it's the Adidas. Is it Adidas New York? It's, it is, yeah. The, yeah, the yeah, blue one. Blue one. Yeah, it's yeah. Carlos, Carlos, isn't it? Is what? It's a Carlos, is it? Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, it's, called. it's a light blue one. Yeah, it's the Carlos yeah. one. Yeah, that's that's boss. Well, obviously, you know, shoe man. Um, but <laughs> it, it's well, if any, anybody wants to check uh, John's art workout, um, he also does prints. But it's um, artistjohncharles.com. Uh, I recommend you go on it and and just look through. It, it got from Bob Dylan to uh, Stephen Graham, um, yeah. Van Dyke, Trent. Uh, you got the Hendo kiss in the Premier League, you know. Yeah, yeah. What more do you want? Come on, Liverpool fans. And um, <laughs> I, I do. Before I forget, um, please go check out um, John's documentary on YouTube called "The Golden Lines." Um, w- we'll get into a little bit of that today. But if you want uh, a good two hours of John's life, uh, please go check it out. Um, I watched it about two weeks ago. And I did tear up. Uh, I'm all right. I'm a, I'm a real man, real man with real tears. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I, I teared up because uh, some of the stuff it is very emotional. You know, I mean, when you get that amount of baggage off your chest, uh, you yeah. know, and like I was saying off, off, off the show, you know, some of that was me. Yeah. You know, you take a good look at yourself when when you hear somebody else talk about, you know, what they went through. You start to listen and you're just like, yeah, that's bang on, you know, and, and that's a lot of people these days, especially, you know, what, what's going on pandemic wise. Uh, people are stuck in their house, you know, alcoholism is up, drug use is up. Uh, yeah, it's a sad state. Daisy. You know, mental health is, is, is bad. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't look like it's going to get any better anytime soon. So, you know, uh, and, and it must it must be great to, to be an artist, though, John, uh, and be able to, you know, with what's going on in the world, what's gone on in your life, be able to put that on canvas. You know, you pour your heart and soul out. Yeah, that's, for me, I'm, I am blessed. Like, I've no doubt that um, it's a blessing for me to be able to do something like that because... I get a lot of private messages off people when I do certain patents. <clears throat> so some patents might be angry patents, some pa- patents might be happy patents. Um, I might put bits of like drink and drug addiction or mental health. I, I paint a, a variety of different things. Especially if you go on my Instagram, um, which is artist John Charles, you'll see the grid and there's a lot of variation of what I paint. And for me to, because I'm not great with words, I've done a bit of poetry, um, but for me to try and explain myself, sometimes I find it hard to write that down. So if I can stick it in a painting, then I will. And I think there was a painting that I've done years ago where I, put, I called it, I'll paint out my pain. So it's, it's like a recovery for me on its own to be able to paint. But I am concerned just in case people are thinking, because I skipped from the age of 15 before and I've started talking about the art. And I've missed out what's in the middle. So I don't know if you want me to touch on that at all. Yeah, yeah, please do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, John John has, you know, uh, a past. <laughs> well, we all have pasts. But, but um, yeah, that, that's what we're going to get on to anyway. But, uh, John, if you, if you want to uh, lead the way. Yeah, cool. So, because you'd asked the question before, when did I sit back and think, oh, hang on a minute, like, I could do something with this. And it, it, it took me until I was at, um, 27 before I started painting properly again. I wasn't. It wasn't until I was about 35, 36 where I really thought, this I could do this here. So, like I said earlier, I left school at the age of 15 and I started working in bars and it was mainly at events and stuff like that. And for me, that's where drink started straight away at the age of 15. Like, you were bevying, you were drinking all the way through whatever event you were working at. And then when I turned 16, I got a job as an engineer. I was only like a little apprentice. And that's when cocaine came into my life, the age of 16 then. And it was literally a night out, and I was absolutely rotten drunk. And one of the lads just gave me a little key with some cocaine on it. And I had that, and I was like, whoa, 
And it was just like this big explosion in my chest and my head. And I was, I loved everybody at that minute. I was going, I remember going out to all the fellas, going, you're my favourite. I loved you. We're like brothers and you're like my dad and all this. And it was literally off this tiny little amount. But then the next day I woke up and I was just like a bag of rubbish. I was done in. But then days later, I was like, that was boss, that. I need to have another go with that. And as the weeks went on and the months went on, it started mounting up. And it wasn't long before I'd go on a night out and I'd be spending 50 quid. Then I'd be spending 100. Then I'd be spending 200 on a night. And then it just escalated quite rapidly. And I, I then got a job as a civil servant. So I was working in an office and you'd think, you know, he's in an office environment. Well, they're all well behaved in there. I was even worse. I was much worse in there. And I always tell the same story about, I, have a, I had a little calendar on my desk. And I must have been about 18, 19 at this point. You know, like a little triangle calendar. And in my head, I'm thinking, I'm snorting a lot here. So I started putting a little marker on each day that I snorted to try and see. Mm-hmm. Am I using a lot? And I remember getting like to the end of the year and the vast majority of the calendar was coloured in in orange highlighter. And I'd been snorting a hell of a lot. But back then, I didn't have a house. I lived at home with mum and dad. I had no commitments and no financial commitments. So it was dead easy for me to just blow all my money on drinking drugs. And then, I don't want to spoil the documentary, so I'm not going to go into it too much. <laughs> but years went on. The addiction grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I even got off to Kenya at one point to try and run away from all my problems. I went over there for a few months and done um, volunteer work, helping build homes and build water wells and harvest fields and stuff like that. The day that I came back from Kenya, within 12 hours, I was snorting cocaine straight away again. Oh, do you, obviously, yeah, addiction, but do you also think it's, you know, the, the people you hang out with as well? They're all the, the same? Uh, do you know what? I would have said at the beginning, maybe, yeah. So, obviously, I had to be within that group for that that one lad to give me some in the first place. I still think it it might have been my destiny to have that anyway. It it might have happened regardless. At some point, it it probably would have, and it probably would have had the same effect. It was just like the, the, the disease inside takes over. But later on in life, I didn't even have to be around any mates like I would often what I call dry snores so I wouldn't even be drinking alcohol I'd just be snorting and it, I didn't need an excuse so there would be nobody in the house so when me and my girlfriend moved in together we were 21 um, there'd be nobody in the house and I'd still get a load of cocaine and I'd still be snorting without a single drop of ale in my hand without a single person around me to influence me to snort the, the addict for me was just took off then well, it's a, a, cocaine's a very selfish drug as well, you know. Oh, it, it God, Because, yeah. I mean, you know, ha- hanging around, you know, uh, being a chef as well and, and uh, DJing, you know, that's, that's a bad yeah. recipe for disaster. Um, but with cocaine, you know, you would see y- your mates have it and, they'd, you know, shove it back in the pocket because they know you're coming. You know, <laughs> it, it, it just is. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, and you got, you got some? Nah, nah. You're like, I just saw you. I just saw you do some. Ah, oh, nah. <laughs> I was a mate, another mate. You know, it is. It's very selfish. But uh, I mean, you you were doing like a lot. Like you know, from yeah. from what I gather, that's you know, that's not not a little dime bag no. as they call them over there. No, in the end, it was like um, I remember, like quite often, so. I don't know what you'd call an eighth of cocaine, but you can see and imagine it was like it was, it was worth only about 120 quid. But in the end, it'd be quite common for, for me to get an eighth, pour it all out, and just nail it, just nail it. And within a couple of minutes, it was all gone. Um one of my final, final big benders was it was about three ounces of cocaine that we went through, just me and one of my mates, and we were sat couch facing each other. And we were just sliding it on a food tray back and forth, back and forth. It's about two or three days. Um, and that was one of the final big benders of, of my cocaine use. But I wouldn't just say 
um, cocaine's a selfish drug, I'd say. Addiction in itself makes a person very, very selfish and evil, conniving, you know, like, you could have all, like, the good intentions you want, but you somehow manage to become a little snake with it. Like, we'll tell you everything, like, honest to God, honest to God, but in your, your, your lying, you're living a lie continuously as an addict. Yeah, I think even the, the smallest of lies, you know, yeah. you, you don't even need to lie uh, sometimes, and it just comes yeah. out, and you're just like, why the fuck did I just say that? <laughs> but again, your, your mindset is like, where, where's me next, you know, yeah. basically sniff from. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, takes takes over your life. I mean, when when did you? Because again, you know, we don't want to go too much. Because I really do want people to to see the documentary. When yeah. when was enough enough? So me, my rock bottom. I was twenty seven. I was work, I've been working on the doors um, as a bouncer for about eight years. Uh, I was twenty seven and I was working in the club. And I'd snorted about 18 grams on my own, like, that night. Just been nailing it all night. I was meant to sell it to try and make some money, but I just nailed it all. And at the very end of the night, you go for, you usually have, like, a pint or whatever when the club's finished. I went to the bar, and I said to one of the girls, Mel, give us a Sambuca. And she, she gave me it, and I nailed a Sambuca, and she just went. I won't swear on the podcast, but she said, like, you're a disgrace, to put it politely. And that, for me, was bump. That was a Saturday, I think it was. And then on the Monday, I, was, I went to Cocaine Anonymous. I dabbled trying to get into AA and CA before, and it never, ever stuck. That time, of it, when I went back, that was it. That was beginning of my new life. And that was when everything began. And it was the 23rd of May is the date that I went back into recovery. And it was just, it wasn't like a rehab centre. So I didn't have to go and get locked away for six weeks or nothing like that. I just went. Cocaine Anonymous, back in there, and that's when my recovery took place. So, on the twelfth, was it helpful to listen to? You know, did he do the circle thing? He stuff? do, he do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, did it really hit you in the face when you started hearing other people's stories? But then also going, shit, that's me. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things in in recovery and addiction is. You feel like you're on your own. You feel like you're a loner. Maybe in your head you're telling yourself you are as well on purpose so you can carry on. But when you sit in the room with, say, 10 or 20 other people, you get to say, my name's John. I'm an addict. Mate, the goose, I still get hit. Here's a lot. Well, all my neck's got goosebumps there now. I was just thinking about it. That's one of the, the, the most, the greatest, one of the greatest feelings in my life, getting to say that. And if I ever go back to a meeting and say it, it still feels like, the same there and then everybody else in that room says the same thing and then they'll share their stories and they're like I'm not on my own here and you meet a whole new brother sisterhood and you then recovery people are your future almost for quite a while to be able to connect with like-minded people like that yeah that's it's a massive um, you need that I think as an addict and to be able to connect do you have a sponsor I did, yeah. I've still got a sponsor now. I don't, I, do you know what? I'm nearly 11 years so clean and sober now. Um, I very rarely have to use my sponsor. Mm-hmm. Um, I will still dabble in and out of the 12 steps. Now, I'm not saying that's probably not the best advert for it because you should be continuously doing the final steps over and over and over again. But for me, the obsession to snore cocaine and drink alcohol has completely gone. So I don't battle ever. So you'll, you'll hear some people who were like, oh, every day in, the, in recovery is a battle. It's horrible. They've probably not, not done recovery properly. Uh-huh. That, in my opinion, I handed everything over to my higher power. And I know people get freaked out by that. I, I'm not religious, but I do. I have, I believe in a power. I believe in a power greater than me. Uh-huh. I have faith. So, um, all the addicts, all the, the the needs for cocaine and the need for drinking drugs, it's just completely gone. There's no obsession. I could go, I've been to my sister's wedding, I've had my own wedding, I've been to my best mate's funeral, I've been I've been 
to all kinds of events and I'd not what I could hand on art say I'd never once thought I'd love to have a line. Because for me, the 12 steps of recovery completely took that away. So I don't live life battling anymore. I live free. Like my life now is so simple. The simple things in life I enjoy. Like I've just finished a cup of coffee and that was a beautiful cup of coffee. I absolutely love that cup of coffee. I might look out the window to see a little robin land in my garden. I'm like, wow, how lucky are we to be alive? You know, just the simple things, walking on grass in your bare feet. And it's like, I love it. That's life for me now. Is, yeah. is living, good, man. Living, breathing, you know. And, and I'm sure, you know, your family's noticed the massive change. Um, yeah. And it must have been tough on your family. Yeah, very. My wife, she... She um she had to deal with it all on her own for years because she didn't want to admit to her mum and dad or my mum and dad what was going on. She she had to battle with that on her own for years. She see me going and just crumbling and crumbling and just turning into somebody I wasn't. Um, when addiction really got hold of me, and here are my daughter, my wife and my daughter. There, I call them my why. They're the reason why I do everything. But before it got to that. For me to get into recovery, it, it was for me. I had to do it for me before anybody else. Now, 11 years on, they're reaping the benefits. My family are reaping the benefits. I am. And it, you know, life is still tough. I'm not. You still have bad days and dark days and stuff like that. But I don't need to use on those dark days. I don't need to use cocaine or drink on a bad day anymore. Mm-hmm. Somebody can cut me up in the car. I'm not going to go home and have a line. Because <laughs> that's what I would have done in the past. So yeah, um, if, the, if, if anybody is listening or watching this podcast, what I would say is um, if you're struggling with addiction or think you might have an addiction, reach out, to, I would say, to somewhere, even if it's a, outside of the immediate family, reach out to a friend, reach out to, I don't know what, you, you must have recovery centres around yeah. wherever you are, and just say to them, listen, I've got a problem with an that minute then, honestly, I can't explain how boss that feeling is to say to somebody, I need help. The person at the end of that phone or that, behind that door, they'll embrace you straight away because they deal with that every day. You're not going to be a stranger. They're not going to be like, Ugh. See, I think that's what some some people think is that, you know, you're going to go into these programs and everybody's just going to look down on you. But yep. it's, it's not like that, is it? No, nope, definitely not. They are full of like enthusiasm they want you to have the life that they've got. You might go into a meeting and you'll have somebody who's only 30 days clean. You might have somebody who's 25 years clean. That person who's 25 years clean doesn't act like they're any better than the person who's five days clean. Because re- I'd say the record for recovery is only 24 hours really anyway. Um, the, the meeting rooms are amazing places to be in. And you could be sat in the room with somebody who's homeless. You could be sat in the room with somebody who's like, a CEO of a bank, you can the differences in like you might you know classes and all that that's out the window. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter where you live, what you own. When you're in there, you're all the same people. Yeah, still a drug addict, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. don't matter. Don't matter what you look like. If you an addict, you're an addict. Um, but it, it must have been really great, you know, for your for your missus to be that rock, because yeah. a, a lot of people don't don't have that you know they, they they fight the battle by themselves and and you can see it on them but when you have that rock with you you know it, it is a little bit easier you know to to get th- over these hurdles 100 percent. but um like if somebody is like if you haven't got that immediate family there then i would still say you can do it your sponsor would become your immediate family that, that's your that's your new rock kind of thing. And if your sponsor's doing the programme right, then they'll get you through it. So is your addiction now painting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, it's, it's so bizarre too. Be, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I, I have a mate, the uh, Irish lad, um, absolute nutter. He used to do, uh, uh, you know, bartender tons of cocaine and you could tell he was on it now his yeah. addiction is running love it yeah he, he said he he woke up like 
in the hospital. Like he blacked out. He woke up in the hospital. Was like, you know, what, what's going on? You overdosed. He, I know, I know he told me a bit of a, a fib because I know it's not real. He said, you know, he, he locked down, he ripped off all, all his stuff and just walked out the hospital. I was like, no, you didn't. But <laughs> that story, you know, but, you know, basically he was like, that's when, like, that's rock bottom. I can't, I can't go any lower than that, pretty much being dead. And, yeah, he just runs. He's like Forrest Gump. <laughs> I love runs, it. runs and runs. And I'm like, hey, if that keeps you, you know, sane and keeps you off off the drugs then just keep running mate you know yeah. so i mean exactly. being an artist as well you you you've got to like we said you, you pour your heart and soul into it but i mean to be able to get up and do what you do you know uh, uh, obviously you're not gonna have good days all the time and you yeah, know yeah. like you said with your, your paintings something might be a dark painting, but that that's again, real life, you know, yeah. nobody, I, I don't know anybody who's a hundred percent happy, like every single day, you know? So, you know, what, what's, uh, what's one of your happiest paintings? Um, have you done paintings of your messes and your, your kids? In the very, very early stages, I haven't done one since. And um, so my, my painting, has evolved over the years. So over the past 11 years, it's, it's really, it's, let's say 10 years, it's changed a lot. The past three years, it's really, really like evolved into where people are seeing it and they're like, that's a John Charles. Straight away, people know what it is. So the paint that's only me missus and me, and me daughter years ago, I think I've been there, to be honest. I have probably just been there. Um, but, Happy paintings, these these tons of them. To be honest, I love painting in colour. I done one recently of um, of a Buddha, and if you see me painting in colour, then it's usually a really happy moment for me. But sometimes they might still be. Um, I've done a few dark paintings. So about three years ago, I done as a solo exhibition, and in that exhibition, there was I think four or five pieces, and it was all based around drinking drugs and recovery. And it was kind of saying, like, in uh, in addiction, there's only three places you end up. You either end up in sobriety, a mental asylum, or you end up in a morgue. They're the only three places for an addict. So I done paintings based on that. And one of them was a painting of me in a coffin. It's a really dark. A lot of people cried when they seen that. My mum couldn't look at it. Um, but then there was another one. There was about five different faces all around, which was me, like, in a mental asylum. But then the final painting was sobriety and it was me sat holding a robin and the glow of the robin's chest that lit up my face and everything. So that's one of my happy paintings kind of thing. Um, vast majority of the time, no matter what I'm painting, I'm always happy. Mm -hmm. You'll know if I've had a little bit of a mood if I paint religious. I tend to always say, I'm not religious like I said before, but I tend to often paint Jesus when I'm angry. Don't know why. It's just a thing that it's become, and every time I've done it, the painting of souls, people love them. Um, I don't know why. I've still, one day it'll come to me why I turn that way when I'm angry. But um, abstract work as well. I, I can do a lot of abstract work if I'm angry because I tend to, you can get a lot of emotion when you do abstract stuff. But, Back to your question, which is a happy painting. <laughs> um, well, when when you do get like angry, are you swearing at the the, the painting while you're doing it? Oh, fuck. yeah, I've probably got slip knots as well playing in the background, like oh, Jesus <laughs> heavy music will just be blasting when I'm when I'm when I'm, if I'm painting angry. Um, I'm just trying to think of happy paintings. I feel like I need to get on my phone dead quick. <laughs> Quickly look at something here. I mean, on the, 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 Bob, the Bob Marley one's got to be happy. Yeah, well, like I've done one of the Buddha, a happy Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, I've done, let's have a quick look here, some abstract stuff. With, if it says all you need is love in it, then you tend to get a happy painting. I haven't painted quite, to be honest, a lot of my paintings recently have been quite happy. I've done one of a Robin called Undercover Angel. Um, 
I don't know if you've seen that one. That's just a giant Robin painting. And that's a happy painting for me because Robins are like my thing in life now. If I see a Robin, I can just in instantly be happy. A lot of people in our family and a lot of people around here believe that if a Robin lands in your garden or crosses your path, then it's, it's a loved one who's passed on or moves on to the next life kind of thing to come back and say hello to you. So Robins are a big thing for me to paint. That's a happy painting for me. Have you have you uh, you ever thought of you know doing a mural? I always get asked to do them. Always get asked to do them. Um, quite often I say no because for one I use a palette knife, so it's not a brush. So I'm not too sure how that would work stuck on a wall, so textured. And at the same time, I don't even know how you price up a mural. So like if somebody wants me to fill a giant wall which is about 20 foot by 20 foot. But then if I do a canvas painting, say three foot by three foot, am I supposed to then charge like five times the amount of that mural? It doesn't work for me. And I don't like audiences either. I don't mind having like a camera on while I'm painting. Mm -hmm. But then share with people, but I don't like people stood around me watching. Like That's the only time when I come a little bit arty-farty where I'm like, no, this is my space kind of thing. This is my time. I like to be in my studio when I'm painting, not on a wall with people watching me. Are you uh, you all right with you know? Because I know you've, when you when most people see a painting, they'll see something different from the actual artist. How, yeah. how are you? How are you with that? Because I, I know some, some artists are just like, well, this is my interpretation, and I don't understand where you're getting yours from. You know that, that, what what comes to mind is Jackson Pollock. You know, you, you just see his splashes. He thinks different. You're just like, well, that's just splashes to me. But uh, <laughs> I mean, how, how do you take it? Like, because obviously you just, you've also said you did the art show. You know, what 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 did people, like they come up to you and, and, and actually, you know, say to you? So one thing I love is that I can paint something. And in my head, I could, it could all be about love. Somebody could look at that and see death or mm -hmm. they could see something completely different and I absolutely love it. That's the, the joy of art for me is that I can paint one thing with, a, with my meaning behind it. Somebody might buy that painting and have a completely different feel for it. So it's objective, where it's objective, subjective, objective. Whatever people see, I love that. I quite often get people screenshotting pictures and like they'll circle different parts of the painting. They'll be like, I can see an angel there, or I can see a dog, or I can see a man fishing. Little daft things, but I love the fact that people can see something totally different than what I've created. If I'm doing a portrait, it's a portrait. Do you know what I mean? It's like you're getting the person's face. But then I still will get people saying, Oh, but look over there. There's like a little there's something going on, and I can see an angel again. Fine. I didn't mean it. But if it's there, it's there. Do you know what I mean? Uh, what I don't, yeah, yeah. What I, I don't mean, art. Sorry. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you know, everybody has an opinion, whether it's good or bad. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because you're putting yourself out there as an artist, you, you've got to take the good and the bad. You know. Uh, yeah. Musicians, the same thing. You know, a, a song to them could mean, you know, a happy place, while somebody else is like, nah, listening to that. Makes me feel, you know, cringy. Yeah. I mean, I haven't had, I don't think I've really had many critics when it comes to my artwork. I don't think I've had people say, that's rubbish. I did have one lad on Twitter. I've done a painting of a. Oh, God. No, oh, Twitter's vile in it. But I've done a painting of their a Rangers captain. And I think his number is 20. It might be 23, 20 something. What is it? No, it's just number two. He's number two, he is, isn't he? And, um, this lad on Twitter just commented that number two is awful, just saying. And I was like, well, just saying, mate, but I just sold the original and I sold all 50 prints, so just I'm sound with it. All them, all them collectors are sound with it as well. <laughs> but I think that's probably the only time that I've had like criticism. But that's not to say that my work's perfect, because I don't think it'll ever be perfect. I quite happily, if somebody has something to say, I've probably seen it myself before they've seen it. Oh, I mean, honesty, you know, and and that's that's what I get from you. You just you just seem like an honest person, and uh, 
honest. My wife will say too honest sometimes. Is what? My wife will say too honest sometimes. <laughs> well, they well, yeah, know no, I, Wives know better. Well, I feel like before when you were saying about um, what I don't like is when someone's able to be discussing a brush stroke and they're like, I can see he's poured his soul. And I'm like, no, I haven't. I needed that brush stroke there to make the painting. And that drip there means nothing. That's where I squirted too much water on it. It just ran off. I hate that in the art world, the way they make something out of nothing. It's like, if you see Mark, Mark Rothko's work, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't like his work. It might just be red, yellow, and that's it. Now, I'm not going to stand there and be like, oh, I can see so much feeling. I can't, because I don't appreciate his work for that. I appreciate his work because of what he puts into the layering and how he separates his paints. That's what I appreciate with someone like him. I don't start making stories out of it. Mm -hmm. I can't stand that stuff. That's the typical arty farty person with a glass of red wine, like oh. <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, what is it, the long cigarette with the black thing, you know, yeah. out here, like blah blah blah. They know French so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how do you come to like? Because I always wondered about this, like pricing, you know. Because again, how come that artist can, you know, it's a hundred thousand pounds. There's something yeah. like that, and then some somebody else's is 200 quid. Like, yeah, to me, that's all about profile and reputation. Sometimes it's not even about that. Sometimes you might just get lucky, and someone might just offer like X amount of money. And when one person throws, say, 200,000 or whatever they're paying, they all become more than that just because one person's paid for it. Like, I look at my work now. And it's not being big-headed, but I know that my work could easily sell for hundreds of thousands of pounds. I just haven't had the audience big enough yet to see it. Mm -hmm. I've only got a very select audience, so my Instagram's got 15,500, Facebook's got 5,000. I've no doubt if I had an audience of 10 million people, I'd sell paintings for hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's, it's what that person wants to pay for it, isn't it? Mm -hmm at the same time but I do think you've got to build your profile like most places you can't just come straight in at the top you've got to work your way up and I've been working my way up so when I started painting 10 years ago my first painting sold was for £30 that's all I made 30 quid. Um very recently I sold a painting for £4,000 so within the space of five years I've gone from paintings for £100 to £4,000 but is the feeling still the same? So yes. a 30 quid one to four or five yeah. pounds. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm yeah. Just to be able to sell a painting is like, wow. But this will sound proper cheesy, but for me, it's I get more buzz out of people just seeing it. Mm -hmm. You know, like getting to see it. Obviously, I want to sell them because I want to support my family and these things I want to do in life. And um, everybody likes material things. I'm fine with that. I'll, but you could take all of that away from me and I'll still be happy. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I will buy my like, with all my night clothes and that, but you could take away all my Jordans, you could take away all my clothes, you could take away my house. And that's still be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the same with the paintings, you know what I mean? It's like, no matter what, a sale still feels like, oh, wow. It's a great feeling, but there's not a better feeling than having your work up on display and people standing back and watching people smile at it or the inbox messages that I get off people thanking me. I've done a painting recently called I Am Here of a white feather. It's the most simple painting. I wouldn't say simplistic. It's like, it's just gorgeous to look at. The feedback I've had from that off people, not even people buying it because if they buy it, then that's nice. But the feedback of people saying how much it's touched them and how much confidence brought to them and stuff like that. That for me is art. That's you can't beat that feeling. Yeah, you need a t-shirt with that on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Well, um, John, for all you Liverpool fans, John John has something uh, right behind him, and uh, it's the uh, first time you've shown it, right? This will be an exclusive, this mate. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this goes out in like a week or two. 
Um, so hopefully you're not on another podcast and they <laughs> they see it. But uh, yeah, this uh, will be the podcast when it goes out. Good six months easy. Oh, nice one. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But also, there might be something happening with this painting. We're not 100 percent yet, anyway. But uh, so it won't even be getting shared on my social media for a while until we decide what's going on with it. It might have a special home that it's going to. It might not. But um, if you would like me to reveal it so you can see it. Yeah, come on. I'll do the drum roll. Right. Worst drum roll ever. By the way, I'm in my daughter's bedroom, so that's why... Let me just get this floor off there. And if you're on, uh, only going to be listening to this on audio, John has put up a amazing painting of Carragher. Uh, oh, that's freaking huge as well. It is. So it's, it's it must be about six foot. Oh, on, yeah. About six foot. <laughs> um, oh. So, yeah, that's the Jamie Carragher one. That's going to be coming out shortly. Um, uh, is he going to see it? Yes. Ah. He will definitely get a bite of it. 100% he'll see it. Whether he buys it or not, you know what I think. We don't know. Um, but yeah, so I've done a lot of painting of Liverpool stuff. Um, there was a few years back when Mamadou Stafford played for Liverpool. I'd done a painting of him and he invited me and his daughter around to his house. And we went round for the afternoon and seen him and his wife and stuff like that. He dropped the painting and ripped it. Dozy. Yeah, he couldn't keep the ball either. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why Klopp let him go. He was well, incredible. Yeah, he was a naughty man as well. <laughs> late, was... later, later practice. Uh, when they came over to the States, um, actually, I think it was Klopp's first or second year. Yeah, uh, Sacco was late and uh, Klopp sent him home on the plane. So that's it. Never really played. Yeah. He was it. Do you know what though? He was really, he was really welcome and he was lovely to meet him. And um, he even got my painting put on his shin pads as well. He got customized shin pads to put the painting on it. So and then after, since then I've, I've loved painting Liverpool players. I've done a few Everton ones, but they don't really buy as much as Liverpool because they never really have like that one standout kind of player, no like legends and stuff because they're forever changing, aren't they? But um, I've done paints of yeah, Klopp, um, Trent, who else have I done? Trying to look, oh, Jordan Henderson, Carragher. I've got one coming out of Robbie Fowler soon. I've done one of Virgil van Dijk. And that was the one that really helped the Old McVay Foundation as well. We raised a lot of money for the Old McVay Foundation on the back of that because thanks to a contact of the Old McVay Foundation, we managed to get all the Virgil van Dijk prints signed by him. So what we've done was we donated £25 from every single print to the, to the foundation. Um, and we'll be, we'll be announcing that on our social media shortly as well, just to confirm like the, the, the final tally. But when we've done that, we had a, a private anonymous donor, well, not an anonymous donation, just as what his name being shared, but somebody donated £1,000 towards that as well. Well, I know, I, the, I know it's, it's, Virgil works with, with the Owen McVay Foundation, you know. Yeah. And again, like when, when did Mark, you know, come come and ask you? Because that that that's a privilege, you know. Oh, right. So I've known Mark now for a, a couple of years. I first heard him on the Legged Podcast, which mm-hmm. what we were talking about with Andy Grant before. And when I heard him on that, I just came home to my wife. I was crying my eyes out in the car, and I said to my wife, "We need to do something for them." She listened to the podcast and instantly she was like, "Yeah, we need to do something." So we just reached out to Mark and said, listen, how can we help your foundation? How can we help raise some funds for you? So we just started. So when we do a print, so like that Jamie Gallagher painting, say we do a print run of 50 prints, the most collectible prints is print number one and print number 50. They're like the collectors always want them or they want the number of the player. So what we would do is we keep print number one and print number 50. We donate, that's the charity. And then they'd auction that off at one of their events. They, they get about five, six hundred pounds of print. So that's when we started doing stuff like that. And then ever since then, whenever we get the chance to do some sort of fundraising for them, then we do it. And it was only um, in the past couple of weeks, I got a lovely message off Mark. And he said he put it in a message because he didn't want to 
um, ask me face to face because as if I would say no. So he wanted to give me the option to say no. But do you know what? Hands down, like I've had so many great achievements. So I feel like I've been blessed to do and seeing so many things. That's up there with like one of the greatest honours I've ever had of, of my life to be asked to be an ambassador. The, an amazing foundation. What they do for kids with cancer is just, and do you know what? A lot of charities come about every Christmas. Mm-hmm. They don't. They every day of the year they don't stop working. They with Mark and Joe, just incredible. So yeah, it was um, it, one of the greatest honors that I've ever had to be asked to be an ambassador for them. Yeah, we we were actually Mark's first podcast. Yeah, ever was yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, 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 we were really privileged. I, I actually did the interview by myself, and uh, I was I was holding it together, like it it, it was tough, and you know, and, and for Mark as well, because obviously opening up, you know, in in front of you know a camera and and talking yeah. about it, but uh, you know, what what a man. I mean, it, I told him like. He could have easily gone down the dark path as well, you know. I mean, when when you lose your, your kid, um, but I re- related to him actually because I I my my sister lost her son, um, my nephew, uh, you know, the start of his life basically at fifteen, um, and a really bad uh, YTS accident on a farm. So you know, I knew I knew the loss of a child, not not like Mark, because you know that's yeah, yeah. That's, that's his child. Um, but I could relate to it, and you know, we, we've been friends ever since. You know, we, we we'll check back with each other now and again. You know, to see how things are going, and every time yeah. you know uh, the Owen McVeigh Foundation pops up on my Facebook to see, you know, they're abseiling one week. You know, going up a mountain the next week, I'm just like, they they deserve everything. You know, I mean, the key to the city. Yeah, you know I mean? you know I mean? they are incredible. They do more than anyone else I've ever seen. Like Mark and Joe, what a team them two are. It's like, it's like with my wife. She without her, I don't know if I'd do what I do. And I'm pretty sure Mark can say the same without Joe. Would he be able to do all this together the way he does? They're just an incredible team. Um, and you know, they're just lovely, lovely people. Mm. Lovely people as well. That's one of the greatest things of it. They're just kind people. Yeah, he, I, I've already told him, you know, when I when I can come back, because uh, I usually, you know, try and come home a couple of times a year. I haven't been back for two years, but... Uh, He's one of the first, well, apart from family, one of the first ones, you know, I really want to meet. I want to give him a big hug and just, you know, yeah. say thank you for what, what you do for these families. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's just one of those. Uh, there's, but when you think, you know, the world's a shit place and then you see people like Mark and Joe and you're just like, there is some good in this world, you know. Give faith in humanity again, doesn't it, when you see people uh, like them? Exactly, you know, especially what... <coughs> What we've gone through that with the pandemic and everything, and, and it's really made me like take a step back and look how horrible some people are. Like I, I would have thought, you know, with what's gone on, people would have get get a bit closer. I think families have gotten closer, but individuals have just gone ape shit. Like you know, it's that could be another another episode. For, for me to like go off, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand people. I just, you don't want to set me off on this one either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just one of those, isn't it? You're just like, uh, you know, the mass stuff and, and, and all that. I, I just over there, it's like, you're telling me to wear a mask that, that, you know, stops me from being who I am. I'm like, <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. You know, it, it takes fucking five minutes to go in a supermarket, put it on. Take it off on the way out. That's it. You know, I'm just, but, but you just see more hatred in this world. I just, I don't, I don't understand it. You, you know, you, you see it on the, I don't even switch on the news anymore because it's just, it's just bad news, isn't it? I mean, this whole Russia thing is makes it making everyone nervous, but it's just humanity just seems to have taken a big nosedive to 
shit, Phil. Greed, for me, is a lot of it. Uh, I find the past two years, I've just seen more greed than anything else. These select few people who have benefited from the past two years financially. But um, for me, I'm glad in a way that it's happened because I've learned so much more about myself. I've learned so much more about the planet, the earth. You know, I'm now an avid uh, grower. I grow all my own fruit and veg now and stuff like that. Like, I've learned so much about myself the past couple of years. All that stuff, I just put that aside. It doesn't affect me. It might have affected me financially, but I'm not bothered. I couldn't care less. Yeah. I don't care about people's views on it, to be honest, whether you wear a mask, you don't wear a mask, you have a jab, you don't have a jab. I'm not bothered. What I do is what I do. What my family does is what we do. That's all that I'm bothered about. I'm just, I just want to live for each day. I'm happy to wake up every morning. See the see the sky, and I'm like, yeah, sounds it's crack on. Yeah, it's it's so funny, you know. Even in the supermarket, talking to a, a, a cashier, they're like, "How are you doing today?" I'm like, "I'm living, I'm breathing, <laughs> so I'm happy, I'm well happy." Yeah. You know, people aren't. When I, when I stop doing, stop living and breathing, then I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> then you're on to your next life, then. Yeah, ho- hopefully, you know, to so see the old uh, the old family up there. <laughs> Open arms, and hopefully that's not for a long time for, for any of us. Um, but, John, it's been amazing, uh, you know, listening to your story. Uh, again, please go check out his website, artistjohncharles.com. Um, tons of Liverpool stuff, but not just Liverpool stuff. There's uh, uh, amazing um, paintings and prints, and, and I'm sure, you know, some of the paintings that you haven't got prints on, if there's enough, uh, you know, people have bought it, you'll start doing prints. Yeah. But- it's like some people, some paintings we keep as exclusives, one-off kinds of thing. Um, but yeah, quite often we'll do prints because not everybody can afford the original. So we kind of think, well, if we can get a print out there, then hopefully people can afford a print. So we try to accommodate for everybody. But a lot of the thing is as well, my inbox is always open. So you've got the mailer list on my website if somebody wants to fire a question over. My Instagram is probably one of the things I use most, um, which is artist John Charles. If anybody wants to discuss anything around the addiction side of things, just think, oh, I might fire a little message. Feel free. I might not be reply within seconds, but I will get back to them as well. I'm always happy to help. Uh, and also uh, the Golden Lines documentary on YouTube. Please, please go, go check it out. Um, it it is really good, emotional. Um, end of the day, though, it's a happy one, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it's not one where it's gone even worse, you know. And it's, um, it, it gives a, it gives a nice positive message. I think that you know, I'm not. I don't. I don't like the word hope, but that it'll give faith to to many people that if they're stuck in the darkness, that they can see the light come out of it on the other side. What I would say about the documentary is. Wait until after the credits are finished, because there's bloopers at the end. Don't have you seen the bloopers? I haven't actually. I've gone through the whole thing, but I didn't see the bloopers. But when the credits finish, bloopers come on, and it's quite funny. It, it gives you a good, like a good belly laugh. Anyway, I, I'll definitely check that out. Well, John, um, again, a privilege to have you on, and I really appreciate you coming on, telling your story. Likewise, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. <laughs>